Welcome to the Sowing Hope Podcast. This is a show all about implanting hope in our hearts. I'm Bill Snyder, joined by my friend Ann DeSantis. We're glad you're here for our uplifting conversation about faith and how it sustains our hearts through all the seasons of life. Thanks for walking with us. Hi, and good evening. Welcome to the Sewing Hope Podcast. This is Ann DeSantis, and my co-host Bill will not be able to join us tonight, so we make a shout out to Bill as, as he's just not able to make this podcast, and, and you know, family first, and of course, it's summer and a busy time for all of us, so thank you all for joining us here, and I have an amazing guest for all of you. I have my friend, Leslie Cree, and I want to read her bio because she has a wonderful bio. She is a BAIBCLC International Board Certified Lactation Consultant working at a hospital in Harrisburg, PA. She's also chair of the Pennsylvania Coalition, an organization that brings together persons and groups involved in projects supporting breastfeeding initiatives to ensure providers and families have resources and education to meet their breastfeeding goals. Leslie is the proud mother of two children, a daughter, Madeline, and a son, Samuel. Both were homeschooled for several years, attended public high schools, and graduated from university. Now, as mostly an empty nesters, Leslie and her husband, John, of 30 years, John, uh, John are enjoying tackling long-neglected home improvement projects and getting out to see friends now that the pandemic restrictions have been lifted. I love that bio. Leslie, welcome to the Sewing Hope podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's nice to see you and hear your voice and reconnect. Now that the pandemic is starting to lift the restrictions, you know, we're, we're kind of getting out again. It's wonderful. It really is wonderful. And you and I did a podcast, I believe it was last summer with Bill Snyder and I on, on sewing hope and your, your son, Sam, I'm sorry. It was, it wasn't last summer. It was November. <laughs> it was November wow. of 2020. It and, was, yeah, it was a while that, yeah, because Sam was just getting started with his senior year at West Virginia University, and there was so much going on with the election coming up, that's and right. we were mid um, shutdown or lockdown. It was, it was a lot. It was a lot going on. Exactly, and so it's great to have you back again. This time, just you and I, and and for those who don't know, Leslie, Leslie and I have been friends for so many years. And even though she used to live in my area, she moved, I believe it was around 2003, wasn't it? That, that Les, Leslie moved from the Philadelphia area, maybe it was 2004. <laughs> I think so. Years fly by, don't they? they Our do. girls were about seven. Our older girls were about seven, I think. Mm -hmm. so seven, That's maybe. right. Yeah. And, and, wow. and, and so it was a long time ago, but... God always keeps together those that are meant to stay together, I think. And he totally does. He so, totally does. And we met to give everybody a little history here a long, long time ago when we both had our first daughters. They were the same age, pretty much. And we both had attended a breastfeeding meeting in our area. At the time, it was called where we lived, it was called Abington Nursing Mothers. And from across a room, I saw Leslie and I was observing her, she and the interaction that she had with her daughter, Madeline. And I was just amazed because I could see that as young as Madeline was, they had a bond that you don't always see with such a young child below the age of one. And so I, I, I took, got a little courage and I walked over and I said, I, I told her my name and I basically said, I love the way that you parent your daughter. And I, I said to her, have you ever heard of attachment parenting? And that's kind of how that conversation began. And so here we are 25 almost years later. And that's what this discussion is going to be about having to do with Leslie's work as a lactation consultant. And also that she and I both did that thing called attachment parenting, which we will unpack during this podcast. You remember that, Leslie? That, that time? I <laughs> I remember it and I'm getting a little teary because yeah, me too. <laughs> the backstory for me was um, I have a postpartum anxiety and depression. And of course, back then, everybody just said, you know, aren't you lucky? You're staying home with your baby. Everybody gets a little bit of baby blues. You don't confess these things. 
because you don't want, you know, you really don't even know what it is that's wrong. Um, but I had drug myself to that meeting and, you know, anxiety the whole way and enjoyed the meeting. I always enjoyed nursing mothers immensely when I did go and get that fellowship. Um, but when you had come up and introduced yourself, I remember you saying, you know, that you saw our bonding and our attachment and, and you called it attachment parenting, which was so beautiful. I called it barely hanging on. Um, my daughter was um, very intense, high need child. She's um, very highly gifted um, intellectually. And um, she was like that from the word go. And really to have been uplifted by someone who, you know, you just kind of said, I saw you. And I said, like, you saw me. And you saw me. And, and I, I just think that our bond was like instantaneous. And, you know, the Lord does bring people together into your lives, sometimes for a lifetime, sometimes for a season. But those interactions really uplift someone. And, you know, I, I kind of go by that um, philosophy, if you will, in my work. You know, my job is to provide information, some coaching, education, but a lot of uplifting. It's very important that we uplift each other and we uplift our mothers. I'm so proud of the work that you're doing, honestly. Uh, ditto, girl, ditto. Because, <laughs> because we were on that journey together with breastfeeding and not real sure. We knew that it was good for our babies. We knew that it was nutritionally per perfect food. We knew that there was good bonding there. But it was right around that time that our babies were turning about a year old when everybody was saying, when are you going to wean? You know, that kind of thing. Oh, yep, yep. <laughs> and, and we were one of those people, mothers that decided that we were going to do the whole child led weaning and not to get into the, the ages that they wean. We don't need to, to do that today on this podcast because there's, everybody's different with that. You know, it's all different, but certainly when you go beyond the year and maybe even that second year, you're going to be in that minority of, of people, mothers who decide that they are going to wait and see those signs of when the child is, is getting ready to wean because there's benefits to and you know anytime after a year or 15 months what they call long-term breastfeeding um, and there's great benefits to it and we're going to unpack both of those things because i think talking about the benefits in the first year and also of course when you do decide to continue but i'm, I'm so glad that i had somebody like you my friend, my, my wonderful friend, who we went on this journey step by step together, and we learned so much. And, you know, we met people who were on the same page with us. And also, we did meet some moms that kind of interacted with us that didn't understand that wanted to do things a little differently. And that's, that's okay, too, because it's everyone's right to, to do it as they see fit for their child, right. Um, but but you and I learned together, that this was a wonderful thing that deserves to be opened up to the world and say, you know what, this has a great purpose, not just for health, for bonding, psychological reasons. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why it's good. Mm. It's very good. It's and sometimes, you know, it's just easier. There's yeah. some things now, um, you know, all these gadgets and, you know, use this particular rocker this particular you know method um to cuddle up your baby your young child and just give them a little you know of course they all had the pet name and ours was nana and <laughs> to, to just give a little nana and and restore that bond and and center that toddler and um sometimes those those times that you sit and nurse you know you feel at first oh i'm just sitting here again <laughs> but you realize and now with you know 25 years of seasoning on it you know you're you're growing a little human yes and you're giving your you give so much of your child and the lord really does see all the little things you do as a mother um and, and really does provide some reward if you're in that you know you're in the trenches right now and you're you're really in that um exhaustion phase um it is a season um, encouragement always to reach out. I think that um, so many times, especially with pandemic, people really do feel isolated. Um, but that little bit of outreach and, um, you know, yes, it's nice to find people that 
are doing what you're doing, you know, to find that tribe to support each other, but also to realize that your circle has so many diverse people in it and everyone has that, that purpose and that, um, you know, we uplift each other and we get, um, we get so much, even if we would think on the surface, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. I'm not sure I really agree with that, but we can all learn from each other valuable things. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, everything that you're saying, you know, that I'm, I'm on board with because, you know, moms and dads, and just like people, we all come in different shapes, sizes, personalities, temperaments. I mean, the, the list goes on and the decision-making that we do with our parenting is a very personal thing. And, and one of those decisions is the feeding of your child, which you and I know, Leslie, that breastfeeding isn't just feeding, right? It's, it's so, so much more than so that. It's much more of a dynamic. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, a lot of it, and, and some of this, you know, the, like the Lelechi League philosophies um, that, you know, you are relationship building and you're trust building. And not to say that those um, emotions and those bonds don't form from other methods of feeding or duration of breastfeeding, but, um, you know, that we are given a gift in our children. The Lord um, gifts us with His precious children and you know to to take those steps back and and seek that insight and you know going forward making those plans realizing of course that children will always delight in giving you a surprise to your plans and you got to drop back and regroup um, but you think about you know what i've learned how to navigate as an adult as a parent resiliency flexibility um you know, sometimes you get a little bit of where they say like pie in the face, but you, you go <laughs> on and, and you get a sense of humor about it. Yeah, you have grown so much in all of this because, you know, you and I learn together as parents. And then you made a good point because when you're in the midst of whatever your parenting season is, whether it's the babyhood, toddlerhood, and you think, oh my goodness, when is this going to be over? Because if there's going to be like, you know, as Christians, you like that cross, right? We're carrying that cross, yeah. but our cross, the cross is our crown too, right? So when we're carrying that cross and saying, my goodness, this, what I'm doing here, this attachment parenting, it's, it's hard. And, and it is, it is challenging, but the gifts that you get from that relationship that you develop with your child is so worth it. And you said, like you said, you're building the trust. And I do think that that trust lasts a lifetime because and, and, and I don't think that what I'm about to say, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you attach my parent or breastfeed or long-term breastfeed or whatever, does it guarantee that you're going to have a close relationship with your adult child? I don't necessarily think that that's true. It doesn't guarantee it, but I certainly think you're on a good path when you follow your parenting instincts in the decisions that you make, right? So it makes a difference long-term in those relationships. I think it does too, because um, I remember back, back in the day, um, a lot of times, you know, folks would, would sort of see that uh, it, it's, it looked like we were perhaps elevating our child, you know, doing four. And a lot of what attachment parenting is, and in a lot of ways, you know, breastfeeding through until your child is ready is uh, you're also boundary setting and limit setting. Yes. You're teaching your child how to respect their own boundaries, their own self, but also your boundaries and yourself. So mm. going through those processes, um, you know, it's, it's a partnership and it goes from being, you know, the full parent. And now that our children are grown, um, we're, we're mentors, we're friends. Um, so attachment parenting, isn't being your child's buddy, yes. but it's being a child's anchor. And you're teaching a lot about inter interpersonal relationships. And I remember we would really navigate those discussions where people would say, you know, you should put them to um, bed and cry it out, or, you know, it's time for you to wean and, and you need to set the, you know, put your foot down. And we didn't see the world that way. And, you know, our loving God does not see the world that way. If you look at, you know, all the scripture, he wants us, we start out as child. He brings us through, you know, they say you have the milk and then later the meat and you get you get to a point with, with the Lord that you come to him as 
as your father, but as your father mentor. Um, but we are corrected and we are given boundaries and we are given unconditional love. And, and to me, that kind of sums up where parenting is. And yes, you may have a prodigal, um, but knowing in front of the Lord that you did your best and then, you know, knowing that you can set boundaries with that prodigal if you need to. That's so beautiful. It really is because I think as parents, aren't we always growing and learning? I, I do. <laughs> I learn from, you know, my job is supposed to, um, you know, I guess maybe be at considered advisory in the hospital, you know, mm -hmm. meeting with um, the new families. And, and I learn every day something new from the parents that I see, these brand new parents, you know, sometimes it's their second, third, fourth baby. Um, but with even first time, first time holding their baby, doing that skin to skin, mm -hmm. um, I learn from them. I'm truly blessed to do the work I do. Mm. Once again, I know I keep saying this, but like, I'm so proud of what you're doing. <laughs> And um, I do want to mention to the people listening to that, if you want to listen to some other shows with Leslie as a guest, we did do another Sewing Hope episode you can listen to. Because, you know, every time you listen to a podcast, you get more information about someone. You don't always get to touch on the same things. So, And then she was a guest on RVN TV when I was there uh, as a live uh, studio show on uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And you can go to my YouTube channel. I have the I have the video right there on Anne DeSantis YouTube. And you can watch Leslie and I interacting there. And that was a good conversation. So yeah, this is all great stuff. Um, so uh, kind of turning to your work. Um, what, so what is it like for you day to day with with consulting? Mm -hmm. So what is it like um, now where I am in lactation consultants kind of see um, a broad spectrum, but my particular role where I work, um, it's hospital. Um, I mostly circulate to the um, newborns. So the period immediately after birth, those first, um, you know, 36 to maybe 72 hours while um, mother and baby are hospital um, and kind of really working on getting uh, mother comfortable with reading babies, cues and signals, um, positioning baby comfortably, making sure that mother and baby are feeding well together. Um, so there is some clinical aspect. We do um, evaluate or assess, you know, mother's health and, and comfort and safety, and also infants capabilities, reflexes. And um, so there are some generalities, you know, we, we kind of teach in how to make sure you can tell your baby's drinking, getting enough, but also, you know, you customize person to person. Um, these are two brand new personalities interacting because the mother is a new role you take on. We're getting to know baby. Um, teaching parents a little bit about the, the science of it. This is the milk production, you know, cycle. And this is why your newborn does what they do. Um, and just kind of getting, I, I kind of consider it as getting people a launch pad. And then um, we also have outpatient services. So parents are always encouraged if they have um, birthed at our facility to call as they're on their journey. If they have questions because things change do, you know, pretty drastically. Um, but also part of my job is to interact with staff. So teaching, providing information. Um, I was blessed to be able to do an interview for World Breastfeeding Week that will air next week here locally on week 104. And, um, you know, to really spread the word. And we do also have an advocacy component. So even though my other hat as chair of the Pennsylvania Breastfeeding Coalition is not really subsidized by my workplace employment, um, there is an advocacy component to being a staff lactation consultant. Um, so we are planning a lot of things for World Breastfeeding Week. Um, I interact with our um, diversity um, and inclusion and um, vice president, making sure that we are serving and reaching everyone with the information and the support that they need and recognizing, um, you know, cultural differences, um, religious customs, cultural um, background, so that our parents are getting, um, hopefully, as supportive uh, care that they can, because, you know, other cultures, um, we have a lot of folks um, from Nepal, um, we have a lot of folks, um, Spanish speaking, Hispanic culture, um, a lot of African culture, um, that they're getting care that is, is 
uplifting them and not just saying this is America way. So, so it's very interesting, um, multifaceted job. And so, it, you know, some of it's grounded in the science or the biology, but a lot of it is, is counseling and making sure that a mother's needs are met so she can meet her child's needs. Beautiful. You, you're really dealing with the whole person and your interaction, mm -hmm. not just with mom and baby, but with the family, the dad, the other people that are involved. And so I, I love the work that you're doing. And now you're in the Harrisburg area. Can you tell us for people who might be listening to this podcast that live near you and your area? And if they want to reach out to you, how would they get in touch? Because maybe someone they know is pregnant or needs some help. Now, do you ever help people also that are outside of the area? Because I'd love to put that within our podcast, you know, uh, conversation yeah. here. So um, where we are now and the way health systems are designed, um, generally speaking, if you need help, um, going back to the hospital where you birthed or had um, your baby. So for the Harrisburg area, if you birthed at um, Harrisburg hospitals, um, has a phone number that you you get with your um, discharge packet. Um, you can also go onto a website. Um, so the um, UPMC Harrisburg Lactation, um, you can just kind of put that in and, and go on the website. Um, there are in various communities, um, WIC is usually very active to help mothers. If someone's listening that is a WIC uh, participant or WIC client, you can reach out. Um, there are a lot of really good um, resources that you can access online um, to get someone close to you. So um, the PA uh, breastfeeding.org has some information for Pennsylvania. You can also go to um, La Leche League International, find a helper near you. Um, some places have, it's called Breastfeeding USI, is another um, peer-based counselor, um, trained counselor, access point. Um, in some communities and cities, pediatricians have IBCLCs. Um, so reaching out and starting local and um, super important, a lot of times, um, even with the resource lists provided in the mother's groups, um, folks will sometimes call and say, well, I tried out this and that that I heard online or that I read online. Um, to get care that is custom for you and your situation, reach out to someone who can personally interact with you when at all possible mm, yes um, because um you know that we we know you we can talk to you we can get a little bit of history from you and make sure that things are working uh well rather than um, like a lot of people reach out online and i know again during the pandemic we we feel like we had a lot of choices but the um you know the online is sort of general they don't know you your situation um your philosophy your baby any of it so always, um, you know, plug into a resource from perhaps where you birthed um, or someone in your community and, um, and really, you know, make sure that you, you have as much contact as you can. Um, some communities have lactation consultants that private practice, they can come to your home. Um, and some areas, Nurse Family Partnership has um, trained their nurses to help with lactation. Um, if you um somebody who's listening if you reach out and you know perhaps you don't get the reception you expected or the information that supports you um you know second opinions are totally a thing um so um trying again with someone um a lot of times we'll hear you know, oh i talked to lactation with my last baby and they didn't really help and we're always very sorry that we couldn't help someone but this is very personality driven so if, if something doesn't, you know, resonate with you, you feel like you didn't get help, um, you can always reach out to another source, you reach out to like a La Leche League leader or someone to plug you in. Um, for Pennsylvania, um, you could do information at pabreastfeeding.org. Um, the coalition is not a direct um, mother care provider relationship, but we can resource people to someone in their area. Oh, thank you so much. That's a lot of great information. It's and, a lot. And we're, yeah, we're really working really great. towards building, um, recognizing state and um, countrywide, there is, a, there is a very big deficit in access to help with breastfeeding. And it is a shame that it is kind of put on the parent to reach out at this point. It's, it's not a given that you can just, um, you know, ring up a certain number. But 
um, starting starting local is um, usually can find someone and then um, you know widen your circle as as needed. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing because uh, you know when you're a new mom and a lot of times moms come from like working full time or part time. I think I think a lot of times you you would know better than I would. But with that said, sometimes people don't have the resources right away. Yeah. And they're coming from a different place. And so when you hear that idea of starting local, it's kind of like when they say when you eat, eat and buy things locally, it's good. Right. It's the same thing. Absolutely. <laughs> so Absolutely. I, I love that. And, um, and I will say this, I mean, you and I had our first children, you know, Elaine was born in September of 1996 maddie was born in june of 1996 and you know life was different back then there was no i think there was internet but you know most people didn't even use email that much i don't think at all i know i didn't we didn't really start using email i think until like maybe about 1997 or 98 and so with that said it's a different world where you can just pick up your phone and google breastfeeding and and think you're getting the best information and you probably can get some good information, but Leslie made a good point that people are all different. You have different style, you have different parenting beliefs and a different schedule and a different family and a different baby for that matter, right? So yeah. I think it's all great information to know. Uh, now, do you know the website for La Leche League? I think they're just a wealth of information in terms yeah, of what, just... about what we talked about earlier about the attachment yeah. parenting. Yeah, it's just, I think it's just LLLI.org, or if you search engine um, Google or Bing or whomever, not to put corporate names out there, um, but you put into your search and it will pop up the website. And then they have that, um, it's all different languages. You can translate if your English is not your preferred first language. And they also have um, a, like a um, menu item that you can go in and find someone local to you. So it's online information that is accurate, evidence-based and supportive, but it's also access to local information. And, you know, I kind of also want to put out there, um, when you're going online, there are um, folks who may have had um, health complications or their infant has health complications that um, online answers really um, might be a little detrimental to your effort. Mm. Um, so making sure that, if there is uh, any misgivings about how baby is doing with diaper output, weight gain, uh, growing as child gets older, that the um, pediatric and the OB or the midwife are on board with this because there are a lot of dynamics here that take place physically. And if you go online and they'll say, oh, you know, your baby should just breastfeed more. That can work, mm -hmm. sure can, nurse more often. But what if there's a um, something that a doctor needs to look at with mom to help her produce milk. What if it's something the baby's having trouble, um, you know, extracting the milk? So making sure that that there's eyes on and um, you know, listen, moms always, always, always listen to your heart. If you feel like something isn't right, it's not going right, reach out. Um, sometimes they'll say, "Oh, my doctor said the baby's doing fine." You have to feel fine in your heart that this is going well. It is okay to get second opinions. It is okay to get third opinions and um, you know really integrate what you're learning and and best use it to your satisfaction. Mm, totally agree. And I don't know, I'm sure you've heard this before and it always made me laugh because jokingly I said, uh, <laughs> then I must be somewhat intelligent, I guess, jokingly I say that because the more questions you ask, they say the sign of someone who's who's intelligent, right? Is someone who asks a lot of questions keep asking absolutely yeah. and and kiddingly i say i remember being in class where the teacher said you asked too many questions or something but you know i i you know what i'm saying but we the point of it is, is, is that kiddingly i say you know i jokingly say well that it must be pretty smart lol right but, yeah. but don't be don't feel that yeah. asking questions makes you like a pain in the butt or something to someone <laughs> because the more questions you ask you. that's how you get information and yeah. you and, and you have to go to different sources too if that makes sense you you have to go to different sources to get 
answers and make sure you go to the right source too. Like Leslie said, that personal connection is very important. And, and someone like Leslie, who's a certified lactation consultant. And so if she's in your area, I mean, I can't say enough good. She's the one you want to get in touch with. Oh my goodness. <laughs> feeling a little overwhelmed about that. Um, but you know, yeah. definitely, um, I, I kind of like what you said about asking questions and I'd say at any point in wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if someone tells you, you ask too many questions, that person is in the wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Always, oh, yeah. always someone should welcome your questions and answer them to your satisfaction. That's right. Because this is your baby's life. This is your life. This is your relationship with your baby. I just want to say one other thing is that if it weren't for a lactation consultant, because when Elaine was born, uh, breastfeeding wasn't going all that great for the first week. And I didn't even know about something like the nursing mother's group. But thankfully, the nursing, someone from my nursing mother's group called me and she wanted to check on me. When I told her what was going on, she said, you know, doesn't sound too good. And she was the one that said, you need to get a lactation consultant to your house. And if I did not do that, I, I, I'll tell you, I, I would not have breastfed fed Elaine, my older daughter. And so I thank God that I did because it was a, a wonderful experience being able to do that. It saved a lot of money. <laughs> we know that. I mean, it yeah. saves a lot of money because I did not supplement um aside from the very beginning when we were having those issues we were supplementing a little bit but then i'm realizing that we, we we figured out the problem and then was able to do that exclusively so that that was a real gift what you're doing is really helping babies and helping yeah. mothers and families so it's it's just a beautiful thing another question that we had like a little less list of questions we wanted to try to tackle is Tell us, how has it changed over the years? Because you've been involved with it for quite a while. I have, and it's actually um, one of the biggest changes is um, your access point to getting lactation. Um, I remember with Abington Nursing Mothers and that whole regional Nursing Mothers Advisory Council was a cooperative um, arrangement with hospitals where we filled out that little postcard. Would you like someone from the Nursing Mothers Counselors to call you and check on you? Um, now with HIPAA, and the way hospitals are, those arrangements don't really take place that much anymore. So um, you don't have someone in your community who is like maybe authorized to call just on a postcard and, and introduce themselves and say, you know, I just called to check on you how your breastfeeding is going. Um, so, and things are moving faster and faster. So a lot of times um, moms don't have the leave time. They are supposed to go back to work. So you're trying to tackle recovering, getting to know your baby, getting no sleep, um, mm -hmm. and, and trying to work out with breastfeeding. But yet in the back of your mind is, I'm going to have to make plans to collect my milk from the pump and leave my baby. So there's a whole nother layer here of pressure that, um, you know, fortunately, where we were at in our lives, um, you know, it economically made more sense for me to stay home. We sold our car, my husband took the train, we lived near the city, and, um, you know, I didn't have, yeah, I had more expenses once you fi figured in childcare and daycare, more expenses to work than to stay home. So we ended up, you know, that I stayed home, and, but not everyone has that option or choice, and so the pressure is, is really increased. Um, the other thing that has changed is um, medical complexity. Um, we recognize as our culture and society, we have um, the obesity epidemic, we have the opioid epidemic, we have um, folks coming into um, their childbearing years, maybe a little later than back in our day, um, but also coming in with more health challenges at the get go. And those are challenges that require more clinical oversight. So that messaging has gotten out, you know, breast is breast, and, you know, breast is best, and it's natural. But when you've got other health challenges going on, this is going to need some intervention and coaching to make sure that you meet your goals. And it's very easy to get discouraged because you're already doing something brand new, something you're worrying about intensely, and the, the guidance points, um, you know, are, aren't there until you kind of reach out because there is not that contact point where someone calls you um 
I don't know if you remember back when um, you had Elaine, but when I had Maddie, um, a nurse, we had like Capital Blue Cross, whatever, um, insurance, a nurse came to your house to weigh your baby, to check mm, on you, yes. to check on your, so now, and then by the time I had Sam in 1999, that program had discontinued. And so, you know, um, you had said with Elaine, um, your journey, um, my journey with Sam, I had a, a really good experience breastfeeding Maddie and along came Sam, you know, he had a tongue tie, he wasn't doing well. Um, you know, I reached out because I already had networked the, um, the resources for breastfeeding. But if he had been my first child, yeah, I don't know where the Lord would have taken my life. The, the trajectory would have been completely different. Yeah, I because with my second feeding wasn't mm -hmm. working. And, you know, by that point, people were like, oh my goodness, you know, you're so into this, you're practically a lactation consultant. You know, <laughs> what do you think? I said, what I think is I'm overwhelmed. Yeah. And, you know, everybody um, needs somebody to reach out to. And we didn't have that nurse to come to the house that time. And, and just by luck of it, I was resourced enough by that point. But I really do think both of our labs would have been totally different without that interventive help. Oh, yeah. What a difference it made. And I recall those challenges that you had with Sam and was so glad that you worked it all out. And God helped you work it out too. Yeah, it was just did. amazing. Yeah, how was my every day. Mm. Yeah. 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 It was such such a, a good experience with, with even with all of the trials and challenges that both of us had some issues with 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 it because it's not it doesn't always go perfectly all the time. And I, I thought we could backtrack a little bit because I mentioned the term attach and attachment parenting, which I think became popular probably right around the time or a little bit before we had our, our first oldest, each of us. And I had no idea what it was. And the one thing that I will say to people listening is we're talking a lot about breastfeeding, but even if you're not breastfeeding, you can still do something called attachment parenting and just uh, check it out. I thought maybe Leslie, could you talk to us a little bit about your experience with it? And when you see people who do attachment parenting with their babies, does it make a difference for them and for the baby? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't I don't hear the phrase attachment parenting attached to it so much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but there's um, there's been a lot of movement. Um, you know, back when we had our kids, um, everything that came kind of from the the hierarchy. Um, was to limit feeding times, mm. put your baby on a schedule, don't nurse more than this many minutes. And, um, you know, in these quarter century, my goodness, um, there's been a lot of recognition that um, now what they call uh, responsive feeding or cue based mm. feeding. Sometimes they used to say feed on demand, but some people thought demand was a little bit too like harsh of a word. Um, but pretty much I'm building in from the um, very beginning to to read what your infant is telling you and if you know what to look for you can really kind of help figure out what they're trying to tell you so you're looking for those little signs of interest that your baby would uh, maybe need to nurse or need comfort you know sucking their hands rooting around i call it the little chicken peck head when mm -hmm. you're holding a baby um and so that responsive feeding you know also turns into um you know responsive uh, nighttime parenting so back in the day, everybody had the nursery down the hall and you're supposed to have your baby just like cried out. And then there was like, oh, but you could get a monitor and watch them cry. Um, and now the American Academy of Pediatrics is um, saying that their recommendation is that infant has a sleep space right next to the parental bed. So that, you know, the baby's um, like pack and play or little bassinet, whatever, is right next to the parent bed. And that they've recognized the importance of proximity for uh, SIDS reduction, but also, you know, you do develop that, uh, that rhythm and that responsiveness. And once you've started to build in that contact, so that early newborn, it's all pretty much physical parenting. You're holding, you're rocking, you're burping, you're feeding, changing diapers, doing gentle bath. Um, the physical trust builds the emotional trust. And so um, if you're kind of doing more of these um, currently recommended, um, theories, philosophies, I'm not sure how to say it, um, but you're, you're kind of building in that attachment parenting um, ethos. And, um, you know, you, you're kind of automatically starting to dial in to 
what you would notice about your child. Some children need held more than others. Some children need a little bit of personal space. They'll let you know if they want you to kind of put them down and give them a minute. Um, and then you start to be able to read that toddler. You know, you say, okay, I know we're little getting a little cranky, maybe a little hungry. Maybe that second stop on our errands needs to wait because, um, you know, we need to go home and get a nap um, or, you know, whatever it is. But you start to really develop that nuance when you're, when you're tuned into your child and that builds that attachment bond. And then your child is, is building a trust bond with you. They first, um, parent is the regulator, temperature, you know, nutrition, hydration, comfort. And then as child grows and, and steps away, you're still that, that, that like home base. Mm. And so having built that home base is what really furthers that relationship. And, and I think really forms that, that attachment, uh, parenting. Um, so it's really rather um, collaborative and it's constantly evolving as your child matures. Your child's able to handle more on their own. Um, you're guiding them through. So you're not going to parent a newborn the same way you parent a grade schooler. You're not going to parent a grade schooler the same way as you parent a high schooler. Um, but I think sometimes the more um, authoritative or restrictive parenting that was sort of that um, counterpoint to attachment parenting was that, you know, you were authoritarian and your kids were going to toe the line. They're going to yes. go on a schedule. They're going to do their chores. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And, and you don't really build in trust because you're, you're using um, your will to, their, to them. And attachment parenting is saying, okay, this is my child's personality. I know what I need to guide into my child for these values and, and, and to have them be self-reliant. But this is how we do this for each child. I parented both of my children very, very differently. Same mom, but two completely yeah. different children. What worked for Maddie didn't work for Sam. What worked for Sam was never would have flown with Maddie. Um, but you know, you know, that adaptation took place, I think, because we were so tuned in, you could kind of see who needed what. Mm. Does that make uh, sense? Oh, it makes so much sense. I mean, but, some of the words that you used as I as I was trying to really actively listen to you, tuned in, responsiveness, trust building, they're great words. And these are all things that you keep in mind throughout your parenting experience, whether it's that newborn baby with breastfeeding, the toddler, whether they're in elementary school, high school, and even like Leslie and I, kids that are in their twenties, right? I mean, yeah, still so doing that life. trust building, the responsiveness, all of that in, in the relationship. So thank you for sharing on that. And, uh, you know, we got about 10 more minutes left of the podcast. I thought we could touch on if, if we could, any advice that you might have for parents, especially ones that are go, that they are going to breastfeed, the wife is going to breastfeed, and maybe touch on why breastfeeding is, in quotes, the best. And I do think it is. So, um, yeah, there's been uh, more and more um, understood about um, breast milk composition, the act of breastfeeding. Um, so, if you look strictly at, um, you know, where people kind of, I think, enter the, the interest, um, you know, they'll say, are you going to, you know, do breast or bottle? Like they're interchangeable substances. Mm -hmm. um, breast milk is unique. It's dynamic. It is an immune system transfer. It is proteins. It is long chain fatty acids for eye and brain development. Uh, breast milk is targeted every time baby is fed from the breast they're getting everything they need and it's real time. And so one of the most exciting things, if you fast forward to COVID is, um, you know, mothers who had exposure to COVID or that had a vaccine have the antibodies. They pass that um, passive immunity to the child, um, but also um, breast milk has components, immune cells that can actually attack viruses. It can attack novel pathogens. Mm. And it can provide protection. So it protects um, from the very first feeds called colostrum. It's a thick, sticky, um, rich substance until your milk, quote, comes in. Your, your body has provision for that child in the right quantity, in the right um, viscosity, coats the gut. And um, some of the longer term, you know, you have... Um, infants who are less um, sick, or if your child does get sick, it's less severity of illness. Um, but also from the very beginning, um, the act of breastfeeding heals mother. 
the hormones that are released um, contract the uterus. Mm-hmm. Gets um, pre- postpartum bleeding is controlled. Gets mother back to that pre-pregnant um, uterus tone um, and position in the body. So mom kind of tucks back in. Um, it can delay your period, which is nice for family planning. Um, having those um, activities can also um, decrease anemia. Um, mothers who breastfeed have less risk of developing breast cancer. They have less risk of ovarian cancer, um, I think even uterine um, cancer, um, diabetes. So even if you're a type two, um, or um, excuse me, um, gestational diabetic, you have less risk um, further on of having type two or other diabetes complications. Um, so they're just really scratching the surface of what this, um, what this process is, what it does what it provides. Um, so it's something that, um, you know, as parents are considering options, um, you know, how can you um, get the education to get a good start and, and find that support team to help you reach your goals? Because it does take a team. It sounds very easy to say, you know, I'm going to breastfeed, but then you realize I'm very tired. I need, I just had a baby. I need help with things. And um, as you're getting ready to go back to work, having that team so it's like you can um, find the childcare that's near you or perhaps bring baby to work over lunchtime to nurse. Those little things um, that, you know, nine months goes by awfully quickly. But finding out all you can, um, taking a, a breastfeeding class, taking childbirth class, um, and, and building that um, support network. And, and really letting yourself rely on them. And isn't it so awesome that you're part of all of that? I mean, you are part of all cool. of that support system. Cool. And, yes. I'm, and I keep saying for the millionth time, how proud I am of what you're doing. And you're absolutely right about something else. I just want to make a note to say this is that you are, you're so right that I know that they continue to find out more and more. And I remember that when I had my second daughter, Sean, and had to get some information about, uh, you know, that I had, um, had a problem, a health problem that was related to my heart. Thank God, everything is fine. I have nothing wrong with me now, but at the time I needed to get some information about medication. And I found out that there was, I think it was in Rochester, New York, but some type of a a research center that was all about researching breastfeeding. And I contacted them and they were able to help me about this medicine that I was taking about was, was I able to still breastfeed and take this medicine? And guess what? I was able to, and it was one of the best days for me to find out that I could continue to breastfeed, even though I was going through this health crisis and did have to take some kind of medicine but the amount of medicine or the amount of it that went through the breast milk was so minuscule, if any, that it, it, it was fine. So, uh, mm-hmm. so that was a beautiful thing, but you're right. They're continuing to find out more about how wonderful breastfeeding really is. And not yeah. to say, you know, if moms are listening or people who are, have bottle fed their children, you know, as I said, with, with, atta- well, we used to call it attachment parenting, but with this responsive parenting, you know, you can do this no matter what your situation is this right you can do this so, and, yeah. and, and i think the timing is nice now because it is coming up on um you know world breastfeeding week but also now um the united states and pennsylvania is calling it breastfeeding month so you know this has been a breastfeeding focused um program but um a lot of the the parenting and the bonding um can be that is a relationship that is above and beyond milk if you will. Mm -hmm. Also, we have um, a lot of times, um, there's this sense of absolutism. Um, You know, oh, well, I I may not have the kind of job where I can pump, so I might as well not breastfeed. Um, A lot of uh, mothers and families successfully combine using breastfeeding and formula at the same time. Yes. You breastfeed as much as you can when you're together. If you're apart, your baby gets some formula you're, you're, you're still doing very nice things. So for some reason, that implication got out there that, you know, it's, it's like all or nothing. It's either yeah. all breastfeeding or it's all formula feeding. Um, so some moms say maybe don't realize that combination feeding works mm-hmm. for some families and what you're still providing with breast milk is that immune system. Um, breast milk has stem cells. You can express them off, put it wow. on. Burn. 
uh, heals it right up. Um, so um, even if somebody says, I can only breastfeed once a day, that's a huge once a day. Mm. And, and so, you know, that's also Important. something that's, there used to be kind of this mentality that, you know, it was all or nothing. And, you know, most people are realizing reality is everything, not this or, but this and. Mm. That. I'm so, so glad you addressed that, honestly, because even my mind kind of went to sort of the oars, but yeah. you're right. I mean, and and it, people do this successfully. And like Leslie said, even if you do it once, twice a day, the benefits are there. It's amazing. And so um, now we're headed toward the end of the podcast. And I wanted to touch a little bit on faith before we end, because that's something that we both share and and over the years sharing that faith in christ and the faith that has sustained our friendship and also all the ups and downs of life what has your faith meant to you in terms of parenting and what has your prayer how has your prayer life affected your your day-to-day -day living mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a great question and, and i did kind of allude um to you know my children are, are very um wonderful young people outstanding citizens, you know, doing very well, but um, neither are really faithful. Um, my husband and I see differently on faith. I'm a Christian. He is, you know, he says he's a believer, but it, the prioritization is different. Um, so um, it's been me and the Lord. Mm. And I just put everyone in prayer um, and, you know, seeing what miracles he has, has wrought in your life. Um, I, I still say, you know, I have a friend who was healed by a miracle certifiable, take it, take what you will. But I saw the Lord at work. I saw his hand and, um, there's affirmations that come through big and little. Um, and sometimes they'll pray, you know, I don't know, I don't have the right to have you verify yourself to me, Lord, but you know, can you give me a little something today? And something will always come up a gospel song on the radio. Um, I, you know, I had um, an event that I wanted to do when I was working, my boss called and said, can you do me a favor and switch days? I said, I can do you the favor. Those <laughs> um, but I'll tell you, especially, you know, during the pandemic, um, I would come home every night and just lay it all out, you know, because the healthcare workers are under tremendous pressure um, because mm. when we are in the, on the job, it is game on. Our patients deserve our best. They deserve us to be cheerful and optimistic and reassuring and, you know, to, to that really depletes the emotional well. And I say without, you know, Jesus hand on my shoulder, this wouldn't have happened. The, none of this would ever be um, successful. You would never see an optimistic day during something like a pandemic without faith mm. and knowing that he has the plan and he will see it through and holding steady and watching the way that his will manifests has, has been incredible. And I know I'm just, yeah, I can't wait to see what's gonna happen next week and next year. Um, but but really spending a lot of the pandemic just in prayer has has been the, the life source. Well, first I wanna say how much I value you and our friendship over these years of almost 25 years of friendship. What a blessing that's been and uh, not to predict the future but leslie's a lifetime friend i don't have any doubt that she and i will be together for as long as we're here and then when we pass on to i say we'll be in that mansion <laughs> together we'll have our rockers yes. next to each other and our cup of tea and we'll just right. say all the cool things that the lord has done and, and just keep mm. on you know i think that there are eternal bonds and um and I do believe this is an eternal bond. It is. It is. Sisterhood. Yeah. Absolutely. I got it. Uh, this is audio and people can't see my smile. I've been crying and smiling at the same yeah. time because, and we do have to end in a minute here, but Leslie was with me during that difficult time. This is the Sewing Hope podcast where we sew hope into broken hearts. And Bill and I came together because both of us had suffered something to do with our hearts. I had... A, a disease after my second pregnancy, which some of you know, peripartum cardiomyopathy, where I mean, it was kind of a life death situation for me. And and she's right. I mean, my, not only was I healed physically, but really psychologically, spiritually, all the way around. So 
Leslie was there by my side and, and how much it means. Thank you for all you do for others. Thank you for being a wonderful friend, a wonderful wife and mother, a wonderful lactation consultant. He keep using that word wonderful. I could use all these other adjectives of terrific, fantastic, beautiful, awesome, but it's all there. So thank you again so much for being with us. Come back again to the Sewing Hope podcast and hopefully next time Bill can join us too. That would be my blessing. And I just want to say that, you know, praise God for you. <laughs> just you for you. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We will see all of you next time on the Sewing Hope podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sewing Hope on Patchwork Heart Radio. For more information about this podcast and our ministries, visit our websites, patchworkheart.org and andesantis.com. You can also follow and interact with us on Twitter at PWH Ministry or andesantis2.